Hey, this is Tom from MVP Chess. Welcome back to my series on Bobby Fischer's seminal work, My 60 Memorable Games. In this video, we'll be analyzing game number 26 that Fischer played versus Samuel Ryshevsky in New York, 1961. You're not going to want to miss this bloodbath in the Sicilian Dragon. Before we jump into the analysis, don't forget to smash that subscribe button and join Team MVP. Thanks for your support. So Samuel Ryshevsky, American Grandmaster, was arguably the best player to never become world champion. He defeated every chess world champion in chronological order from Emmanuel Lasker to Bobby Fischer. When I read that stat, it absolutely blew my mind. So that includes Capablanca, that includes Aliekin. Unbelievable statistic. He had a fierce rivalry with Bobby Fischer. In 1961, the Pieti Gorski family sponsored a match between the two. 16 games held between venues in New York and in Los Angeles. So the game that we're going to look at next was the second game from this match that was played in New York. So Fisher with the white pieces, Ryshevsky with black. Fisher plays E4, best by test, of course. Sicilian on the board. Fisher opts for the open Sicilian. And we have an accelerated dragon. Now, Fisher thought that Ryshevsky came well prepared to the match to meet 3c4, the so-called Marazzi bind. So he wanted to deviate. He wanted to take Ryshevsky out of his opening preparation, which is a good practical decision for match play. So he decided to play knight c3 here instead. Bishop g7, bishop e3, both sides developing normally. Bishop e2 and Ryshevsky castles in this position. Now, I've highlighted the, the d-pawn here because over the dragon proper, you notice a key difference here in black's position, and that is the pawn is still back on d7. Black did not play d6, opted for knight c6 instead. So, Fisher always has to be on alert for Ryshevsky playing d5 in one move and equalizing the position. So, for example, the natural castle's king side in this position could be met by d5, where after ed, knight b4, Ryshevsky is going to come back and scoop up this d pawn and as completely equalized. So, not what Fisher wants. Fisher instead decides to employ the so called Aliekin's attack, pawn to f4 here. So, nice aggressive move from Fisher. Ryshevsky plays pawn to d6. Fisher drops back the knight, knight b3. And after bishop e6, g4, we see Fisher's idea in this position. He wants to go full steam ahead, play pawn to f5, and attack this black king. So, Ryshevsky plays d5. Always a good idea in the Sicilian if you can get this move in with black. But of course, this does allow Fisher to execute his main idea in the position, which is f5. The bishop drops back to c8, and Fisher grabs on d5. So after knight b4, okay, notice Ryshevsky's going for kind of the same maneuver that we discussed before, playing d5 and then bringing the knight to b4 and coming back to scoop it up. But Fisher thought that the old warrior, as he liked to call him, would be not prepared for the modern handling of this position. If there was one weakness in Ryshevsky's game over the years, according to Fisher, it was his opening preparation. So Fisher played bishop f3 in this position, holding on to his uh, nice pawn on d5. This does, however, allow Ryshevsky to take a couple pawns on the king's side. But notice what's happened. Okay, Ryshevsky's up a pawn, but He's a bit overextended on the king's side, and the king can become vulnerable here. So after queen d3, pawn to e6, trying to chip away at Fisher's pawn on d5, Fisher castles to the queen's side. So black's king is definitely feeling a little drafty. This pawn on g4 is overextended and could maybe be used as a hook or be able to one, one outright. So... I think Fisher has accomplished his goal out of the opening. He's got a sharp position against a player much older than him where he has great attacking chances. 
So really nice opening opening play by Fisher. After knight takes d5, here we see Fisher's really nice thematic move in this position is pawn to h3. Okay. So trying to use this extended pawn on g4 as a hook to open up the h file. Of course, Bashevsky would not want to take <laughs> G takes h3 here because all of a sudden the h file is open and this is just going to be a disaster on the h file. Okay. As Fisher famously said against the dragon in game two against Larson, pry open the h file, sack, sack, mate. Here, Fisher's been able to pry open the h file without even sacrificing materials. So this would be just a tailor made attack for Fisher. So after h3, Ryshevsky plays a good move, pawn to g3 trying to keep lines closed. So he's managed to keep the H file closed temporarily. He's also managed to keep lines closed on the G file. So Fisher decides to pivot, okay, and transfer his attack to the G file instead. Ryshevsky continues developing and Fisher takes here on D5. Nice exchange here by Fisher, just kind of clearing this bishop off the G file so that Fisher can maybe look to take on take on G3, double the rooks, and get nice play going against the weak black king. After E takes D5, Fisher plays a mistake here, according to him. He plays knight takes D5. He should have played bishop D4 in this position. And Fisher said... Looking back on this game, I would play this move almost immediately now. Instead, in the game, he played knight takes d5, excuse me. And you can see the, the key difference between the two. With bishop with the quick bishop d4, Fisher's looking to exchange off black's dragon bishop. Once this bishop goes in black's position, the king is lacking defenders, and checkmate is pretty much imminent. But this gives, as... Fisher says, Ryshevsky, some breathing room. King h8, bishop f4, queen g6. So Ryshevsky, up a pawn, facing an attack, makes a very logical move in this position, queen g6, offering the exchange of queens. So I'd like to turn it over to you in this position to test your attacking chess. White to play here. What should Fisher play? Pause your videos and have a think. So there are a number of good moves in this position, but they all involve moving Her Majesty, okay? Fisher is down a pawn. He's the one with the initiative. He's the one with the attack. No way does he want the queens to be exchanged. So congratulations if you just recognize that because queen e2, queen f3 would both be good moves, just avoiding this exchange, keeping the, king, the queen in a nice attacking position. Fisher instead opted for queen d2. But congratulations if you just noticed that, given the dynamic nature of this position, a queen exchange would benefit black and not white. Ryshevsky grabs his pawn on h3, but this allows Fisher to open up the g file, and things are getting really dangerous now. Bishop g4. So Ryshevsky has managed with this bishop maneuver to transfer the queen's bishop to the king's side and plug up the g-file. So Fisher once again needs to pivot his line of attack, okay? We we saw him after h3 g3 transfer from the h-file to the g-file. Now the g-file is plugged, he's going to transfer back to the h-file so he plays work h1. So nice flexible attacking by Fisher um really making use of what his opponent's giving him in the position. Rook fe8, knight e3, Fisher challenging this light squared bishop. And after queen e4, unfortunately, this was a huge mistake by Samuel Roshevsky. He finally cracked. Fisher noted that early on in the opening, both players were playing at a very brisk pace. But Around move 20 or so, Ryshevsky began to consume a lot of time. And Fisher noticed this and was trying to sharpen up the game. K4, 
keep a lot of pieces on the board to hope that his opponent would blunder, make a mistake in time trouble, and that's exactly what happened. So I'll turn it over to you again. Urshevsky just played Queen E4. How should Fisher respond in this position? Pause your videos and have a think. So congratulations if you found the move, the very natural attacking move, Queen H2, great move. Notice the Rook is on prees in this position on H1. The Queen is on this open D file. We definitely want to get her off. We also want to attack the King. That's why Queen H2 is just such a great multi-purpose move. By far the best move available in the position. After Bishop E6, Fisher plays another great move okay rook takes g7 so as any of you dragon players or yugoslav attack players anybody with experience with the dragon usually once this dark square bishop goes it becomes a really difficult defensive task for black just because the king is really vulnerable and it's very difficult to defend the dark squares, pure and simple. And notice here, Fisher, since he attacked, since he sacrificed the exchange to win this bishop, still has this dark square bishop available to buzz around the king and create a lot of threats. Notice this rook and notice this knight that are just completely on the other side of the board. Okay, they're playing in New York. It's as if these pieces are in Los Angeles <laughs> waiting for the second half of the match to start. They're not in the game. So you can hardly even consider this a sacrifice given Fisher's superior development and activity. King takes g7, and here we go. Fisher starts infiltrating on the weak dark squares. And after rook g1, Ryshevsky is forced to part with the queen here. Fisher, of course, accepts <laughs> and begins to activate his worst place piece, which was this knight on b3. So Fisher with a completely winning position here. Ryshevsky played on for a little bit, but the end was never in doubt. Rook a d8, bishop e5, great move. Look at, if you want to look up a textbook definition of weak dark squares or how to attack on a color complex, just look at this game. Black's dark squares are... A complete train wreck. It's all about that dark square bishop. So rook d7 trying to defend. Fisher grabs. And after rook takes. Now the knight is joining the party. It's getting ready to potentially land with devastating effect on the f6 square. Which is why Ryshevsky attempted to defend. And once again, Fisher pivots. Okay, His opponent defended, but... Fisher found a way to just keep keep up the pressure and reroutes the queen to the g5 square in this attractive diagonal. After rook f1, king d2, h5, Fisher played queen d8, and in this position, Ryshevsky resigned. The only really defensive idea for black in this position is rook f8, but after knight h6, king h7, queen takes f8, Fisher noted... No, noted in his annotations that this defensive task was even a tall order for Ryshevsky, um, who was a great defensive player, and Fisher really admired his defense. But he said, even against Ryshevsky, I was confident that <laughs> I would get the win here. So understandably, after Queen d8, Ryshevsky resigned. Great game by Fisher. I really hope you enjoyed this analysis. Um, so Ryshevsky tried to get Fisher into... His opening preparation in this match, which Fisher really thought was the Maroxy bind, Fisher deviated. Okay, he was constantly on the lookout for this d5 equalizing move against the dragon, and against an older player, okay, who was prone to time trouble, Fisher sharpened up the position, went for Alyekin's attack, kept the game really sharp, really dynamic, and eventually that strategy won won the game for Fisher because Ryshevsky blundered. Um, let me just put that move on the board with queen e4. Um, just completely abandoning the king side, allowing Fisher 
to just create devastating threats on the H file and on the G file. And another key move to remember from this game, Rook takes G7. Great move by Fisher. Never be afraid of giving up an exchange or certainly exchanging the dark squared bishops when you're white against the dragon. You really want to get this dark squared bishop, this dragon bishop off the board because once you do, black's king side can just really fall apart just like in this game. So thank you so much for watching. Be sure, smash that subscribe button, join Team MVP, turn on your notifications. You're not going to want to miss my next installment, which will be game number 27. We'll see another game from this match against Samuel Roshevsky. Have a great rest of your day. Thanks for watching.